Welcome to Become Famous Podcast, the ultimate destination for achieving fame in your industry. Join us for discussions as we uncover the strategies and secrets to becoming known, navigating cancel culture, and staying authentic. Stay tuned because here at Become Famous, the journey to fame begins now. Welcome to part two of Going Deep Into Fame. I'm your host, Torn Brand, and this has become Famous Podcast. You listeners have been asking me, what is it about fame? Tell us more. And I get a lot of that, and then I assume people know what I'm talking about, because I've studied it for three and a half years. I've practically gotten a PhD on it, but sometimes you need to take a step back and explain what are your thoughts, what, are you, what do you believe about fame? So in the last episode, we talked about um, fame. We're in the fame revolution where everyone... Become, needs to become known for what they do because 86% of the world has a smartphone and um, you are competing with AI, but AI is also your friend. And with all of this artificial intelligence products being come out, flooding to the market, making our lives easier, but at the same time, almost becoming this quasi person, we are longing for the real. We're longing for you, for me, the touch. And it was so interesting because my mentor was telling me, don't delete your LinkedIn profile, the history. And I actually did that on Instagram and I regretted it because now in today's society, we want to know, are you a person? Are you who you are? And this is the history and have a historical reference. And in all of this, of the fame revolution, I do believe taking a step back. I'm kind of, um, I love the Hellenistic age. I love the ancient philosophers. I got like a degree in Norway, which I really love. It's almost like a minor here in the U S on rhetoric, um, and philosophy, like the whole kind of thought process of how to make arguments, how to debate, how to dialogue and learning from all the philosophers up until today. And I really love that because I think there's it's important when you have an idea or philosophy or something that you really believe in that you have something that's underpinning it. And so what took me long to write the book was who can I rely on? So I went back. I mean, I've, I've practically written a book on, on the history of fame, which I'm thinking is going to come out next year, uh, going through all of the various references of it. But I, I think the most important reference is really from the ancients. They had three ways of thinking of fame. And I think in the, we'll get a grasp of it, but really more important, what I believe is we all want to become famous. We all have this desire. And I have a lot of clients of mine that don't like when I say fame, fame famous, and they would rather say visible because we do have a sense of there's a part of us that don't like fame. And I think it's what Aristotle talks about is the superficial fame, the more negative aspect of fame. And there's several uh, philosophers that do touch on the negative aspects of fame. And, and we've seen that in our culture. And, and it's kind of like the kitsch way of us looking at fame. Like, at least for me, I thought of it as sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And you're out there um, just wanting to pursue it. It's a narcissistic pursuit. And, and a lot, when I've been talking to people, think of this age more as a, as the narcissistic revolution, because we all have to take selfies. Psychologists are talking about the damage of us actually doing that. Uh, but there's all this stuff out there about, about it. And we're not really landed on what, what's the danger of this era of, of having to suddenly be out there on camera. And it really means that we are all public figures, which is really my theory is that we're all public figures now. And the lessons and the way of strategies of, of helping people become known, which I have done for 20 years with political leaders, CEOs, artists, and so forth, is this sense of you thinking of yourself as a product and putting yourself out there. But that is a next, that's the next episode, actually. But today, I want us to take a step back really think about what is it about fame. And so what I discovered was when I went the rabbit hole with Socrates and Socrates to me is, I really admire him. And I admired him even more because five years ago when I was looking for a business name, I wanted it to be tied to the ancients because I love them. And I wanted to find a Greek God or something that had depth of meaning to, to the company that I was going to found. And it took me three months to find the name. And the name was Diotima. And I'm pronouncing it the Norwegian way, but I, I love Diotima Strategies, and that's that's the name of my company. But Diotima was actually the mentor 
to Socrates. And I saw that on Wikipedia. I saw that on various references, but I never really read the original source. But when Socrates gave me that quote that I found that the perfume of heroic deeds is fame, well, I got to read Plato's Symposium. So I read Plato's Symposium and lo and behold, who is his mentor? And he actually gives credit to her. And I love that. I love when a man at that age gave credit to a woman. He gave credit that she was his mentor, director, and in the Plato Symposium, of all these highfalutin men from all different walks of life that are that are from the higher, the elite group, if you're going to talk about it anyway, they sit around and they're having a symposium on love and life. And Socrates gives the word to Diotima, the only woman in this in this arena. And when she stands there, she talks about something that really the Western philosophy has based a lot on love. It's called the ladder of love. But when I read, read it, I was like, there's a different ladder there. There's a fame ladder. They talk a lot about immortality and that's what they reference more so than fame. But I was like, wow, there's a ladder of fame. And what I loved so much that it was a woman and I actually went to, um, a philosopher, a, a professor in Norway uh, from philosophy and asked her, you know, I see this ladder. <laughs> That's not the ladder of love, but it's something she said before. And because she's talking about love and immortality, but immortality is a lot about becoming known for what you do beyond when you have passed. Right. And so I talked to her and I, and I've always been such respect for the people that come before. Like for me, it's been always easy to, follow everyone else, be behind the scenes, support people, be coming up with a new theory, new idea. I think that's one of the reasons why it took me a long time to write the book was because I'm going to do something. I believe this. And I remember when I was telling her this, well, this is what I see. And she goes, that's your interpretation. Go out there and tell people. And, and that was a big gap for me to actually write this, think about it and come seeing this different way of looking at immortality and fame, taking the philosopher's idea of immortality and the way they thought of it into a modern day perspective, which is kind of, which is what I did in the book. So the last, the last, I have three parts in the book. The third part is really about the philosophical underpinnings of the theory that I have and showing that we all want to become famous because what does Diotima say? When she's in the Plato's Symposium, she says that we all kind of want to be immortal. And I don't you feel that? Like you want to become seen, you want to become heard for what you do and who you are. And I think that is a lot of what we what we do and see. So, anyways, I just thought that was a really interesting thing. And so taking a step back then, so in Plato's Symposium, she talks about the ladder of love and you can read about that. I can put a link in the, uh, in the description about that. Uh, but when you read beforehand and she talks about the immortality, like that we, there is a ladder and I just saw the ladder of fame and what is the ladder of fame? Well, the ladder of fame really for me is that when I was reading her and I was reflecting on it is that in us, we have this biological clock and yearning. We yearn to have kids. Society's built on who is the heir of your ideas. And so like, for instance, with me, I come from two farms that have been in the family for generations, right? And it was always who, and it was something called primogentre, where it's the oldest son that inherits it. And it wasn't until the late 60s and 70s that it was just the oldest. They shifted it to the, to fit the era of feminism. But it was about who inherits it. Who do you marry? And if you look at the royals, like we're like, we're all like in awe when Kate has kids, uh, the, uh, the uh, coming queen of Britain, right? And, um, uh, who is, who is Prince Henry, Henry going to marry? Who is like, we're all thinking of those things, right? It's our society's revolved around the sense of the child and why. And this is what I felt I learned from Diotima and Plato's Symposium is that we have a physical yearning and I call it the physical level of fame. It's the first level. It's the physical level. We have this physical yearning to become known. And I think this is when I talk to family, uh, 
or friends of mine that have become grandparents is that they suddenly see their fame beyond their life that it's going to it's going to be perpetuated through the seed of the next generation right part of you goes with into the future and i just thought that was so fascinating because i think this is why we all yearn for it a lot of I mean, most people have that yearning for it. And if you don't, you go on to level number two. And even when you've had kids, when you've had kids and you're in that empty nest stage, what is the next thing I want to do, right? Or you're younger and you're not necessarily wanting to have kids and get married right away. So you go to, to level two, which is what I call social fame. And it's not like it's chronological because, for instance, I haven't had physical fame. I've not had kids. So for me, that's not a phase or a ladder that I have pursued. But pursued social fame, which is level number two. And what is level number two? Level number two is really about we attach our name to a group or to people we believe in. And I remember this when I was working in politics. It was so important. Who is the presidential candidate that you're going to stand behind? And and who who aligns with your values? It wasn't just that I'm going to blindly follow someone, but do I align with the values of this person? And it's almost like picking horses in a horse race. Like, who are you going to think that's going to win the political campaign? So you're like betting your hedges. Okay, do I go with this, the winner here? Is it the one that has the most likelihood to win, right? So uh, we attach ourselves to what we believe in. So we could be part of a labor union. We could be part of our school community. We attach ourselves to a community and we pursue leadership in to the philosophy of that community, which I think most of us would love to stay just there. At least for me, I didn't really want to pursue anything else, but because of society right now that we're in the fame revolution where 86% of the world has a smartphone, we have this with AI, we are thrust upon ourselves. And not only that, what I talked about last time was that we are all arbiters in society right now. Now, there are some people that might have more influence, but the collective itself has, has more influence than it's ever had in history. That is my perspective. I'm coming out next week, next year with a book on the history of fame, because when I was doing this deep dive into fame for three and a half years, I also wrote the history of fame. And I think that was one of the reasons why it took so long to publish the book, because I had too much information. We didn't know how to distill it down. So, so that's, um, so what's fascinating with that is social fame is where it's like what political party you're going to be a part of. We, we know exactly where you are. It's like when I lived in, when I lived in Harlem, um, you know, I was in Harlem, you get attached to the Harlem community. So even though I was white, having lived there for a while, I became part of the community, accepted me, which was absolutely lovely. And, and I remember uh, the gentleman that lived downstairs for me, he worked for General Patton. He was 94 years old when I met with him. And it was so lovely to see how he was known in his community. He was known for what he did. People knew who he was. They greeted him with Mr. and Sir and, and he was, uh, he was famous. He was famous in Harlem and it was a privilege to be a friend. I could call him my friend uh, at one point and we would sit there on a hot summer after work. I would sit there next to him and he would tell me all these stories and you're like, wow, what was, what historical moment for me to meet someone that was so close to being the cook to General Patton. And so we all have these small things of way of becoming known. You don't have to be known in the biggest circle. And I think this is where fame gets a bad rap. And I like that about Aristotle because Aristotle talks about two kinds of fame, the superficial fame and the virtuous fame. And so, and I think in society, we have attached ourselves so much more to a superficial component of fame, which I kind of call celebrity culture, right? Uh, but there is this kind of narcissistic pursuit that is really about just gratifying yourself. And so what I like is, is the virtue of fame, which is what Plato talks about. And that's really what the latter fame is. It's the virtuous cycle of our lives. We want to make our differentiator have a mark on, on the planet and life, right? So like a lot of my friends are working in the circular economy movement, sustainability movement, because they're attaching their name and their legacy to movement because they want to be a part of changing the world. And that's social fame. So you got public fame, social fame, right? Then the next one I would think comes, and it comes a lot with empty nesters or when you have pursued a career in corporate or doesn't have to be that could be younger people that just really want to 
contribute. And like when I remember when I was young, you would see these younger authors or that just pursued, they just left and went not really rogue, but they went on their own and they tread new grounds and they come with new theories. And, and I haven't really been that way. And so for me, that's why I think the book took so long to write was because for me, I, I really like to be grounded. I like to be behind the scenes and, and want to make sure that everything I do follows what has been done before. But so many people break ground and that's where you come to the next level, which is what I call the public figure fame. And that is when you branch yourself out and you become known for your thoughts, your ideas. And in that part, it's really about literature, writing, books. It's your creativity that you bring or a company that you have built that is yours. It's your footprint, your name. And I really think that this fits in with what Teddy Roosevelt, he did a fantastic speech on what is the downside of fame. And I, and I, I think that this kind of prepares you for how to manage. And I think this is one of the reasons why my clients, I have clients that are on social media and they're having a really, really hard time with the critic. Because when you are a public figure, you leave the safety of your tribe, the safety of the social circles that you've become known in and you're pursuing and breaking ground. And when you pursue and break ground at any kind of level, like I hear that all the time right now with TikTokers that don't know how to handle the critic, they don't know what to do. Um, and, and at the same time, a critic makes you relevant. If I think the hardest part when you're on TikTok and you get zero views, 50 views, 100 views, and, and that's happening a lot more now, I believe because of the flooding of AI, that all our individual ideas and viewpoints can be categorized and grouped into something that's already been said before. And I like what Ecclesiastics says in the Bible, there's nothing new on the sun. And yet, there's a new twist and the twist, I believe comes from you. And when you're pursuing fame and when you're getting to the public figure level where you are leaving the tribe and it was funny because my original name of my book was crossing the chasm leaving the tribe i had like all this like this long title because pursuing fame there is a chasm there's a chasm between social and public where you have to find what's inside of you and have the courage to talk about what you believe and say. And for me, it's been, that's not been easy. I have to say that I've loved being behind the scenes. I have loved helping people with their ideas and books and, and create the strategies, supporting them, uh, seeing them, hearing them and, and help them go out there. And, and suddenly now what I see is we all need to be visible and, in that pursuit, when you become visible, you get critics. And so I'm going to read Stepping Into the Arena because I think it's such a fascinating, really, speech that oh, I think some of us have heard, but I do want to read it because I think what happens is when you're going into the arena and you're stepping out on your own as the public figure, this is really when you start honing. And I really think of it as the butterfly that's right when you're ready to fly. The metamorphosis of all the ideas you have, what you want to become known for at that point happens. And that's when you become the public figure. That's when you have the wings and that's when you fly. And when you are, have the courage to talk about your ideas, I tell my clients, you need to be prepared for the critic and not just a critic, but to be viral, viral and being a critic is the same danger. And I call them both a crisis because it is putting unprecedented pressure on who you are, taking you out of your regular day of operations and you need to handle it. And I've talked to a lot of people that talk, talk that, oh my gosh, I didn't handle my viral moment. Right. Right. So you didn't make money out of it. You didn't, you weren't able to capitalize it onto the next level. And a crisis can, can put you down five steps back. But as the Chinese say, crisis is also an opportunity. So I think that um, that in that influx there, I want to read this because I think it's so important for us to realize that when we step into the public figure, when we step into becoming known for what we do, this is what we need to be prepared for. And what was interesting is when Theodore Roosevelt said this at the Sorbonne University, it 
became like, and the title of the was actually Citizenship in the Republic, in a Republic. And he famously dubbed the man in the arena. That's what, that's what we all know for now. But it became such a huge hit. It was like an overnight success in that time. And this is the part of the speech that we all know, but I really want to read it because as you're reading, and I'm assuming when you're listening to this becoming famous, you're, you're seeing that you need to become visible and how do you prepare for being visible? And so this is what it is. The man in the arena. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them be better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who errs, remember that, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcomings. But who does actually strive to do the deed? Who knows great enthusiasms? the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while doing, daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never know victory nor defeat. And I think that's and, and you can still feel that when you're, you're in like a, in a group where you're becoming known and you're rising. There's just like this, there is this mix where, where do you a public figure and where are you in, in the, um, in the social fame? But it's the metamorphosis of you becoming the butterfly. And that's why I have on my book, the butterfly, because to become known, you need to have all of this ready of how you're going to pursue yourself. And so the hardest part is really leaving the tribe and, standing up for what you believe and and for some people it's hard to have the clarity and that's that's what we help out with we help you find clarity with my 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 business we help you find clarity find your branding we help you find with strategy and then we support you uh, mentally because it's a tough thing Uh, some people can't handle the critic and i remember this guy that i read he was one of the most eloquent on health issue that i've ever read and it was just like this regular guy talking about um complex health issues but in such a simplistic way and people loved him gravitated he was like got over a several million followers on youtube and these videos were coming into my feed and i was like listening i was like so obsessed with him i was listening to everything he had to say and what was fascinating was he suddenly stopped and I love, I love this. This is what I, it's kind of like my hobby. I love to explore people, how they become known, where they go, what happened. And it suddenly stopped. This date just stopped. Nothing, no announcement, nothing. And I was like, this is so odd. So I went down like a little research to figure out where did he go? What happened to him? And sure enough, it was, he got some critics and he wasn't ready for it. And, uh, he basically, and it was so sad because he had t-shirts around this and I'm not mentioning his name because I really respect who he is. He really requested privacy. He had mental issues after this because then I went on Facebook, which was public and I could see like him struggling and he went into a whole different pursuit. He's not on social media much anymore. And so sad that someone with such great ideas. And I do believe that if he'd found a way to handle the critic, he would have stayed because his insights were so important, but he didn't get the right support for himself internally, externally. A lot of people support him, but there was something that he just could not take the credit. And so a lot of what I do is help people prepare for that, prepare for that critical moment and not let it get to you. But it's always hard when when someone says something they don't like about you or don't like your theories and you're like, oh, wow, that's not what I meant. And I meant what you said, but you're interpreting what I'm doing completely opposite. So I just thought that was a sad moment for someone that had such great contribution. And he took away his website. He took away all of the stuff. I never got to see it because I, I actually found him five years after he actually left the whole arena. But um, he had had a website, he had a following that was huge, and he just let it go. 
So we can't underestimate the feeling of how hard it is to have a critic. And that's why I talk about in my book, there's a big chasm between when you're in a group and you're known, like if we're a political party, you're going up the ranks, you're socially accepted. Because a lot of times when we go for the greatest differentiator that's in us, we're going to have haters. We're going to have people that don't like us. And if we don't have it, then we're really not standing up for something. So I just thought that was a really fascinating um, journey. And, and that's why I think the whole fame ladder, there is, there's a sacrifice to becoming known and to becoming what the philosophers say, immortal, right? And so in the pursuit, then you've got the physical fame, the social fame, and then you get yourself into public figure. And then from there, you're ready, you're ready to fly. And then it's just about getting yourself known, get your word out there, right? And so when you get your word out there, then you're then you're known, right? It's just, it's just, it's just repeating and repeating and you're just going out there. And that's how you see a lot of people like Richard Branson, who was the founder of the Virgin brand. He started with records. Then he did, um, airline and he did phone trains, right? But he just took the same formula. Like when you become to a certain level, which is this public figure level and you're known for one thing, it's easy to branch out to everything else. And that's why I tell my clients, stick with one thing for the first two years. If you want to become a public figure, be known for what? known for something that you do don't put all of what you want in the kitchen sink stick with one thing which is not always easy right and then sometimes when you're in that beginning phase and you're thinking this is the issue no one's really reacting how long do you stick with it that that's really a case-by-case -case basis but after that what happens is and this is what i tell my reluctant because I really help the reluctant people they know they need to be visible and they're reluctant they don't really like my become famous tagline but they're intrigued because they need to become visible we all need to become visible that's what my whole point is visible we need to be public figures there's a lot of baggage around fame so they don't like it but they said torn i like visible i'll be i want to be visible but visible really with the next level is luxury fame become visible that's that's the luxury of fame it's the beauty of fame it's the fame with the virtue that i was talking about and i think when you get to that level you then are known in certain circles so and i remember when i was interviewing the book i got to meet someone that i really admire nasim talib who is the gentleman that wrote the black swan which is considered the century's most important book uh, that was basically um, Fortune magazine, I think it was, that was mentioning that. Not quite sure who said it, but it was basically collectively one of the most important books. And um, in The Black Swan, he comes with this whole idea that's different from anywhere else. And I got to meet him personally during a um, conference I was at the Oslo Business Forum a couple of years ago. And I asked him, I said, Nassim, so when did you know that you were famous? And he looks at me, he goes, I'm not famous. And I go, yeah, you are. <laughs> He goes, no, I'm not. And I go, yes, you are. Uh, I was being polite about it. But they had, you got 800,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, we're here. We're, uh, we're in awe of you. And he goes, I'm not famous because when I was at a resort last week, no one knew who I was. So that's where you see the definition of fame, right? We all have this definition that fame is more like a celebrity. Oh, I want your signature. I want this. And when I asked my mentor, David Berman Scott, who has sold over a million books and is a guru, if you go to a marketing conference, you'll know him. You're like, oh, please help us. And I, I've been really privileged to call him my mentor. And he was the one that actually told me I needed to write this book. I asked him, so when were you famous? When did you know? And he goes, I'm not famous. People know me in, in the marketing circles, but they don't know me. And so I was so perplexed by this and everyone I was asking at the Oslo Business Forum, because I'd privileged, I had like this access where you could talk to the VIPs that have been speaking that are famous. And what was so interesting, they're all saying, I'm not famous. And I think as you become known, as you become a public figure, it gets to be kind of what is the definition of being famous, right? And so I, a, a friend of mine, um, a consultant from Transcended, her name is Sarah Haroldson, was basically saying they have luxury fame. And I love that, luxury fame. That's why I put that as the next level. Luxury fame is becoming known in your industry circle. You don't get chased around <laughs> wanting the signatures. And, and I think that's really what the next level is. And so that's really where I help my clients get pursued because you don't need to be known in all circles. You just need to be known where it's going to make sense for you. Like where are you going to make the money? Where are you going to make the recognition that's going to help you pursue the things that you want? Like, so my friends in the sustainability circles don't necessarily need to be in 
in, in, in another different, in, in a circle on economics or in something that has nothing to do with their pursuit, right? You want to be known in those circles that's going to take you to the next level. And so the last level is timeless fame, which is the immortality of fame, right? And, um, and that's where you have like the ancients, like we know Socrates, Plato, Horace, uh, all these known people that have passed the test of time. They become classic, right? And, and I think we want to go back there is that, so my whole definition of fame is I'm following Socrates, Plato, and um, Aristotle in the sense that fame is a virtue. I really believe that fame is a virtue and that fame is a byproduct of a virtuous life. And you see that with a lot of people. And uh, that's, that's the fame I'm pursuing. Of course, there's so many different colors to fame, but that's the one I like. And, and so you have Socrates believing that you have Plato, like the ideal of fame that those who seek knowledge, truth, and justice rather than those who pursue popular claim. And, and I think with the popular claim, what I like about what Aristotle does is he basically says fame is for noble actions, but he distinguishes for that kind of one that Plato doesn't really like, that public recognition, you're only pursuing it for public recognition. And it's really the superficial fame. So he had the good deeds versus superficial fame. And then uh, Cicero then talks about that you can achieve fame through being a great public servant. But the other thought that really comes in, and I think this is where when you're reading, when I read Plato's Symposium with Diotima, um, making this great speech, um, is that what's really, really key is that people believed in that time, like Homer, Herodotus, and Virgil, really believed that fame could give you immortality. So they viewed the path to immortality where being remembered for one's deeds ensures a form of eternal life. And Homer does that. He calls it the glory of fame, Cleos, a fame through heroic deeds, particularly in battle as a way to achieve immortality. Heroes like Achilles seek the glory, the fame to be remembered forever, right? And then you have Herodotus who believed in the historical immortality that you write these historical uh, fame that th through that, that you're granted immortality through history. And then you had Virgil who believed fame through destiny. And the Aeneid, fame is tied to fulfilling one's destiny and contributing to the founding of Rome. So he really believed to be the legacy to be remembered as part of Rome's eternal history. Now, there are negative parts, and I think this is where fame gets a bad rep. Um, and it is where a lot of us are, at least I used to believe this, is, is the negative components of fame. And that's where you have the cautious part of fame. And that's Ovid, who was a from Rome. He believed that fame had a double-edged sword. And it's true, it does, right? It's uh, He recognized both the allure and the dangers of fame. He worked often to picket fame as something that could lead to personal ruin, misfortune, and suggest that pursuit of fame can have a destructive consequences. And that's where I think a lot of us see the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, like this big rock star comes out there, celebrity, and then all the fame just destroyed him, right? And so there is that component. I'm not going to lie to that. I think I didn't focus so much on that in the book. I was focusing more on just getting the theories out and, and, and making us have a debate about this, right? Seneca had this was a stoic critic of fame. And Seneca has been someone that's really been in the forefront becoming known like with Ryan Holiday and a lot of these various uh, people like Robert Greene bringing to the forefront the more these stoic ideas. And he, as a stoic, Seneca was critical of the pursuit of fame, seeing it as an eternal, etern ultimately unimportant goal. He warned that fame could lead to vanity and distraction from true wisdom and virtue, emphasizing that the inner peace and self-control were far more valuable. And we then getting public recognition. And it's true. Uh, and then Pindar, who was another um, poet that came after Virgil, he celebrated fame achieved through excellence, particularly in athletics. And he, he actually wrote, which I thought was so fascinating. He wrote uh, the Olympian odes, glorifying victories at the ancient Olympic games. And we just had the Olympics. So I was like, wow, I'm going to go and look into that. I didn't realize there were all these Olympic odes. <laughs> But anyways, so that's where that's where the ancients go. So you have fame as being a way to become immortal, the negative part of fame, and then you have fame as a virtue. And I really think fame is a virtue. And uh, I think if we pursue, become known for what we do, 
and we live the virtuous life, um, we will uh, become known in what aspect uh, and how, what level. I think this is where I really like Marcus Bellinger, who was someone that I interviewed, who was a producer, produced some of the biggest stars in, in, um, in music. And uh, he was basically saying you become known in certain circles, which is what I really think it is. The luxury fame component of becoming known in certain circles. You could be the best mom in your community. You could be um, doing baseball. You could be the baseball coach that everyone remembers. Then when you retire, everyone's really sad. You're known in your community. It's not that becoming famous has to be a global international recognition. And I think if you keep repeating what you're really good at, in that time, you then become known for what you do. So that is today. That's what I wanted to talk about today. So becoming, looking more from the ancients. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what the public figure of fame, like what does it really mean to be famous? So uh, stay tuned. And I want to say thank you. Uh, so if you have any questions or want to explore further, um, that would be great. And have a lovely day. Thank you for listening to Become Famous Podcast. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. Your support helps us keep in bringing you valuable insights on achieving fame in your industry. Keep shining and see you next time.